Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started, and um, I'm going to start, we'll start off with a roll call, and then after that, we're going to have our Pledge of Allegiance. Mrs. Sugars, please. Mrs. Matlack? Here. Mrs. Neary? Here. Mr. Avadia? Here. Mrs. Seidel? Here. Mrs. Scarpolino? Mrs. Schultz? Here. Mrs. Stratton? Here. Mrs. Tong? Here. Mr. Goodwin? Here. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. do have a, a great program planned looking forward to it for tonight uh, introducing our teachers and also uh, uh, special honors for Rosa uh, middle school national day of uh, national history day but before that we got to start off with the mundane stuff and I'm going to um, ask for a motion to accept the minutes from our regular action meeting on August 27 2019 and Committee of a Whole and Special Action Meeting on August 13, 2019. And the executive meetings dated on the 13th and 27th as well. Uh, Mrs. Matlack and Mrs. Schultz, are there any questions about those minutes? Okay. If not, Mrs. Sugars. Mrs. Matlack? Yes. Mrs. Neary? Yes. Mr. Avadia? I have to abstain on the executive on August 13th. Yes, to the rest. Mrs. Seidel? I need to abstain from the Committee of the Whole Special Action and Executive Session on August 13th. Yes, to the rest. Mrs. Schultz? Yes. Mrs. Stratton? Yes. Mrs. Tong? I have to abstain for August 13th. I wasn't here. Mr. Goodwin? Abstaining from the regular action and executive um, session on August 27th, yes to the other. Okay, um, next uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Malash for our new staff recognition and then uh, for the Rosa Middle School National Day winners. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, so as we do each year, I am thrilled that, we're, that we invited uh, our newest staff members to be with us to recognize them this evening. Uh, we actually have a list in the uh, agenda of the new staff members. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Wilson and Dr. Smith, are you coming up too? Is it just so Mrs. Wilson and Dr. Smith to meet me up at the podium? And new staff members. Um, so I don't know, you may not have been here when we've done recognition like this before. What we're going to do is Mrs. Wilson's going to read off your name. You're going to come up to the front. Um, we're going to shake hands. Dr. Smith is going to give you a, a pin with two cherries on it. I'm not wearing one, but <laughs> if I was wearing one, it would be right over here. Uh, you'll get to see what it looks like. Dr. Smith is, is sporting one right now. Um, <laughs> after that, you're going to come around and shake hands with all of the board members, and you're going to shake hands over at the side table as well. Uh, and then you're going to go out front, and Dr. Mahan is going to take a picture of everybody together. You are welcome to come back in and join us for the rest of the meeting, but it certainly is not required that you return. I'm sure you've all got stuff to do uh, to prepare for tomorrow. All right? All right. Okay, good evening. Um, we have quite a few names here on the list, so I believe what I'll do is just read them off fairly quickly, and then we can all applaud at the end, just for the sake of time. Um, so we have Brian Warner, Darlene Iacoviello, Kelly Meager, Anna McKee, Rebecca Billet, Siobhan Kelly, Aaron Redmond, Olga Sanchez, Ju Kilman, Crystal Penepito, Jill Hamill, Stefania Sharbach, Samantha Karcher, Hei Wan Han, April Lee, John Tomaszewski, Andrea Belkin, Melanie Martinez, Francesca Aldrich, Melanie Mijares, Colleen Magley, Joseph Carroll, Hope Ivler, or Ivler, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which that is, Christine DeLuise, Robert Demidio, Michelle Thompson, Adriana Principato, Nicole Arnayo, Kimetria Dormevel, 
Jessica Barreto, Cassidy Polachek, Rashad Majed, Nora Downey, Lindsay Keehan, Amina Saeed, Rebecca Myers, Ann Wallace, Melissa Katai, Ronald King, Katie Gibson, Tyler Brake, Richard Darer, Casey Lazowski, Ann Bernulio, Kari Young, Cassandra Socolo, Heidi Setchell, Kayla Conlin, Kristen Mahoney, Sammy Green, Kevin Clark, Dan Bucci, Jennifer Mooney, Portia Hollingsworth, Lisa Davis, Jessica Fair, Linda Bieberbach, Catherine Rimtius, Jennifer Iani, Maureen Casey, Alicia Coate, Yen Chow, Christy Silverstein, Allison Wastick, Eileen Kahidi, Esther Twum Akiapong, Kristen Hearn, Carissa Nocenzo, Veronica Lopez Munoz, Esther Kang, Sean Allen, Melissa Renier, Janine Gentilini, Catherine Owens, Lauren Nis Nicosia, Cheryl Mulcahy, Victor Branch, Chelsea McQuillan, Kevin Hillard, Cynthia Rivas, Shazia Khan, Aaron Sager, Brian Nace, Michael DeLuca, Robin Thompson, Maria Rebstock, and Ida Abramovitz. I just want to say uh, to the folks that are here and as they're going on shaking hands, so as we open school, the, the new group of folks that we hired uh, is the most diverse group of staff members, certificated staff members that we've ever hired. So a little more than 25% of them as of September 1st had diverse backgrounds and came from, um, uh, there was a, a level of diversity. So we're very excited about this group of folks. And next, we're going to be recognizing our uh, 2019 National History Day competition winners under the direction of advisor Mrs. Christy Morella. So I'm going to ask her to come up and say a few words about um, our competitors for this year. And we have their video as well. And then I believe after that, we will hand out certificates, introduce them, you know, all that good stuff. So. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Just a quick little explanation for this year's National History Day. Sixth place in the nation um, competitors. This was quite the journey. It was something that they write movies about. For me, it's a little emotional to talk about the rabbits. They're the four young men that you'll see behind us. They are known as the rabbits in an international community in addition to Raoul Wallenberg's family. They went down the rabbit hole and took me on the journey of a lifetime. Raoul Wallenberg is a Swedish diplomat and a righteous Gentile, but I like to think of him as a humanitarian as well. He single-handedly saved what would be about today 200,000 individuals, but we know that that adds up to a million voices. His efforts, what he did, and how he did it is truly remarkable, but what's even more remarkable is the four young men back there decided to tell the story and dig very deep. National History Day is a year-long competition. It's a little more than a day, and it's definitely quite the journey. And usually for Rosa, it's a everyday journey. Um, this year in particular, these young gentlemen probably worked over about 2,000 hours on their documentary when all said and done. I don't think they missed a single day after school, a Friday evening, a Saturday practice, or a Sunday at the Cherry Hill Library. They became friends with Louisa Van Dardell, who is Raoul Wallenberg's niece. They love a family historian, Suzanne Berger, and these documentaries go out to them. With their help in this international community, ambassadors, individuals, they created a documentary that enlightens us 
to what Wallenberg did kind of behind the scenes, not just what he did with his Schutz passes. This is something that most people in their historical career hope to achieve, and they did it at the age of 14. That just tells you what National History Day can do for students. It can open doors, portals, and transcend a classroom. For me, this year was really incredible because the rabbits are just a small representation of the five groups that I took to nationals this year. Our other documentary, junior group documentary on Emmett Till was the showcase and featured documentary at the African American Museum and they won top honors as well. So this was truly a amazing triumph, which is part of the theme for Rosa but it really truly is a collaborative effort. The young men back there were supported by the hundreds of kids that did National History Day. The documentary you're going to see today will look at the triumphs and tragedies, and I do stress tragedy because Raoul Wallenberg, he doesn't rest yet. We don't know what happened to him. He was taken to never be heard of again. We tried to find him, and I think someday they hope that they do find him, but all of their Oprah requests were denied. Individuals would not give us interviews because it actually compromised their own personal security. Henry Kissinger was on to us, and that definitely brought some heat, which is strange because you would think, how's that? But when you uncover something so deep as these young men did, you really are rewriting history. As a historian, I could only hope to accomplish just a fraction of what my students have done. But what's incredible is their sixth place win does not sum up the amount of work. 650,000 students competed at the regional level last year for National History Day. They making the finals represent the 0.001% of individuals that can make it to the top 10. At that point, you kind of have to look at the ranking kind of a straight across, not one to 10. I'm so excited for our community who stood behind us every step of the way to see this documentary. And please know that we dedicate it to Raoul Wallenberg's family and hope that our documentary, which helped open new documents in Sweden, will open the documents here in the US and he finally can be laid to rest. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We really hope you enjoy our documentary.
2,000 hours after school and on the weekends are. And these ladies and gentlemen are the rabbits. They are the ones that not only uncovered the information, but told the story of a man that had fallen into the folds of history. We thank you so much tonight for your kindness and viewing our documentary. This is Mr. Ben Shee, Mr. Sean Lee, Mr. Vinaya Chawala, I always say your last name, I'm sorry, Mr. Christopher Shen. That was uh, truly an amazing documentary. Thank you so much once again. Um, next, uh, we I'm, uh, is there any uh, correspondence? Does anyone? All right, Mrs. Matlack. Thank you. I just have a couple of things that I've attended that I'd like to share. Um, so um, I, I've, I am the uh, board representative on the Cherry Hill Education Foundation Golf Committee and their annual fundraiser is coming up on October 2nd. Um, so I just wanted to put it out there, it's not too late to sign up or donate if you would like to do that. October 2nd at the Pensac um, Country Club. And on September 14th, uh, Saturday, as the um, Legislative Committee representative for District 6, um, th we had a meeting. I was away, and um, but fortunately, they have now offered uh, remote access, so I was able to to uh, uh, remotely um, attend the meeting. So um, I do have some some notes um, that I will share, and then I'll have some things that I'd ask Dr. Malash to put in our in our memo that are a little more detailed for board member information. Um, so the the first thing was um, from John Burns, <coughs> who is. Um, reported on the state board and um, excuse me and um, the Kathy Goldenberg is the new president of the State Board of Education and um, in uh, June there was there's a bill that's out s 3433 Mallory's law it makes adjustments to HIB um, uh, NJSBA has has concerns about this um, and has asked us to talk to our senators and legislators about that. I have um, some little bit more details. Um, the three main concerns that NJSBA ha has are that it would mandate that the school resource officer, if you have one in your district, um, would uh, have the authority to make the initial determination on whether an incident is HIV. And then the resource officer must also be designated as the anti-bullying specialist. Second is the executive county superintendent would have a mandatory role in individual discipline decisions concerning HIV. And the third concern that they have is that um, the bill mandates certain disciplinary measures be imposed depending on the number of HIV inf infractions. Um, so because they have some serious concerns with, um, with this, they are drafting, um, you know, formally drafting their concerns and presenting it, and they've asked that we bring it to, uh, to our districts and um, to our legislators what, you know, how, that, how it would affect us as a district if those 
um, things were to be imposed on us. Um, so there's, there's that. And um, also, there's no movement on the Chapter 78 relief bill um, on school funding. They talked about um, the alarm system. <coughs> the uh, SDA has, has not dispersed. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading my writing here. <coughs> Has, done, has not dispersed the money yet. Speculation that has to do with um, improving states' credit rating. They didn't go into detail. Excuse me. They didn't go into detail about that. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to add because I don't know too much about that credit rating. Um, there was talk about the pre-K expansion. There's application classes to fill out how to get the money. 167 districts are eligible. Um, I don't believe that we are, um, but most of the obstacle for those districts not getting their money is that there is a square footage requirement for to accommodate 15 children per room, and those districts don't have that physical space. Um, so. Uh, School boards is also trying to work with them on that issue for those districts. Um, at the, there was an assessment update given by Diane Pasquale, Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Performance from the DOE. Um, recent steps, uh, she sa said that they reduced the testing time, 60 to 90 minutes. They lowered the MSGP evaluation rating. They streamlined high school assessments, two years of ELA and math. Um, and she kept stressing it's called the New Jersey Student Learning Assessment and not PARC. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, uh, the, it, that it's uh, also, she emphasized federal laws are uh, guiding the assessments. Um, I have some more information to, to pass out. They'll give to Dr. Malash, and he can he can send that out to to everybody. Um, let's see. Uh, I also attended the district cultural proficiency committee meeting on behalf of the board as the board representative to that committee. Um, when I I was a little bit late to that meeting, and as I came in, uh, Mrs. A Ms. Adrian was giving an update on HR, um, and it said on the agenda about district hiring efforts. Um, I was not there for that, so I'm not exactly sure what that was. There was goal committee work that was done. Each of the goals on the five-year plan have a committee headed up by an administrator and then members of the committee who are on that. And um, so there are action steps for each of the five years. So the committees were working on those action steps. Um, there's plans for the World Character Day that was discussed. Um, and every school will do an activity that will carry throughout the year based on kindliness. And a Rosa Author event featuring Natasha Tarpley will take place on March 4th with uh, more details to come on that. It sounds like it's going to be um, a widespread event throughout the day involving students and um, staff and parents uh, as well. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other correspondence? Okay, if not, next we uh, have our uh, students. Uh, we have Jack from West and Jacob from East. Uh, and we're gonna have them uh, give us a report. Can we start off with uh, Jack and then Jacob? Good evening, everyone. Uh, so first, at West, in athletic news, we've had the football team. They just had a big win two weeks ago against Penn Salkin. It was a nail-biter. It came down to the last extra point, and they won, so they're starting off their season pretty good. Next, the boys' soccer team started off strong. They've gone 5-3-1, and one, and they just won against Camden Catholic last night, and then they look to have a good game this Saturday against East. And so girls soccer team also started off strong just defeating West Deptford yesterday. They again look to the Saturday against East for a big game. Uh, field hockey just had a huge win yesterday against Timber Creek and they prepare for uses tomorrow. So that's all in sports. In other news, 
West has started a new policy in its school called restorative practice, which helps kids who get in trouble to figure out a way to find the root of their problem or the, the violation. And so the kids are able to talk to s teachers and see why they're breaking the rules. And it's a better way to work together instead of just giving sh straight out a detention. It's a restorative practice, as it's called. And so in other news, the marching band is working day and night every day. You can see them, they practice from six to eight almost every night working so that they can have their halftime performance be um, in great shape. And so that's just a sight to see at eight o'clock at night, these kids still working so late at night. It's pretty amazing to watch, so. Also, uh, this past Thursday, we had back to school nights where uh, parents would follow their student schedule around the school and meet their teachers. That was a successful night. And the theater department is working hard for their fall musical, Matilda, which also includes students from the elementary schools in it as well. So that is going to be a fun play coming up. And Picture Day is coming up this Thursday, so everyone has to get their best smiles ready. <laughs> that's, that's all from Wes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. East is now encouraging kids to not sit and eat in the hallway, which was a common practice last year when kids were given the freedom to choose their homeroom during the lunch breaks. Now they try, um, East teachers try to keep walking for safety and, and rodent reasons to avoid the food in the hallway. Um, staff has been set up to watch the most vulnerable areas, and East staff preaches using your time to your advantage by going the extra help and going to homerooms where your teachers are to see if you can get that support that you can't normally get in the classroom setting. So extra help is available in every subject, and the annex is available for students to hang out. East had their fall sports celebration on uh, two Fridays ago. They were clapped in by the cheerleaders, administration, and coaches. They were all set up, and this will happen for each season, according to Dr. Perry. World, Af World Affairs Council, which includes Model UN for the first time, or was reformed after a long break, and they're able to travel for competitions. So that's really good for students who want to get involved in politics and, and want to be able to experience that after a long wait. Dr. Perry has been having a policy where he's in the annex LB1 and LB2 to make himself available to hear student voice um, and to hear their concerns. This, this is announced over the loudspeaker every morning. Senior year sunrise happened last Friday. Uh, refreshments were provided, which included hot chocolate and coffee and donuts. There was no actual sunrise that day because it was really cloudy, but 70 people came out bright and early and played games and had a great time. There were lots of photos on Instagram to prove it. East had back to school night like West did. It was very successful where the parents follow their kids' schedules. Dr. Perry told me that they'd, um, East has now instituted a new faculty meeting process in the mornings and after school with teachers where they have four faculty meetings a month, one before school and three after school with teachers broken up into groups of 40 to get intimacy and integrate with their departments with their other teachers. They read a book with discussions which is called Engagement by Design to focus on increasing student engagement. This has allowed for smaller, more effective faculty meetings or a bigger, better book club as Dr. Perry called it. Super supervisors lead meetings and Google Classrooms are set up to ensure integration with technology among the teachers so that they are comfortable with the technology as they give it to students. There is a new policy, a new focus at East on keeping phones in the backpack during the school day and out of the bathrooms during visits, which is much more emphasized than in years past. Teachers very strictly enforce these rules because they want to make sure that students aren't missing class time unnecessarily. And now there's a direct link on the webpage for a full transcript to morning announcements, and students are reading them out in the morning instead of Dr. Perry or um, a secretary every day. SGA members read them off, and so it's gotten a lot of student voice out there, and you can hear your friends, and people get really excited about it. This was in direct response to an Eastside editorial, which noted the lack of student voice in the announcements, and that has been a success so far. And that's all we have at East so far. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, sounds like some great things happening in the schools here. Um, next on the agenda, we're going to have our first public comment. Uh, there's two opportunities for the public to comment during this meeting. The first public comment section is for agenda items only. There will be another public comment section for any topic at the end of the meeting. Uh, if you'd like to speak, please up, come up to the microphone and speak your name and address and also what item on the agenda you would like to talk about. 
talk about. Uh, Yoni Yaris 329 Cherry Hill Boulevard. Uh, we're going with the blue sheet, which is the additional item um, for BNF. Just want to double check, I may have missed it, but with the additional 300,000, where does that leave the reserve fund for capital projects? Just curious where that's at. I know we're using a lot of it for very important projects and just concerned about where that is heading with more money coming out of it and those always scary moments that we all think about of what could go wrong during a school year and just making sure we're covered for one of those lovely disasters. On a more positive note, just wanted to say I had a chance to review the two the student supervision at bus stops. And just really wanted to thank the administration and the board for really doing a fantastic job and listening to a lot that my wife and I and others have inputted on and really did a great job in producing a much more improved uh, policy. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and really also appreciated going back to everyone's favorite policy, 8550. And just really think you guys did a really great job in incorporating a lot of feedback. And it certainly was a lot from the community. Uh, only one area that I have a question, if you could possibly increase the threshold just as we increase the cost of per meal this year, if it could be two weeks or an entire week before we start this process, um, would be really appreciated, I think, by the community. Just that $10 isn't so much. Um, so if we could really start either at 20 and things like that, but really just fantastic job in listening and really hearing a lot of came, things came across over the summer. It was a very active summer for you guys. So just thank you very much for that. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Rick Short, 1002 Chelton Parkway. Um, talking about draft policy 8550. We should not stigmatize our students by not allowing them to go to prom. We shouldn't stigmatize our students not being able to go to activities. I feel your $75 price point is high. I think you should lower it. I don't think the district is a collection agency. I know there's 340 parents that are in question. It takes five hours and 40 minutes to call these parents. How many are going to answer? Our counselors, our principals, our superintendent are not collection agencies. There are, there are other ways to collect money. We should also accept donations. This entire program idea, 8840, is a disaster. The board has no, uh, not the board, because you haven't made a decision yet, but generally speaking, from surveys from NewJersey.com, it angers people to not allow them to go to a prom Percentage-wise, and these are non-scientific, non non you're looking between 68 to 6 to 70 percent of people that are angry about this policy. I think there's also people angry in the community. Again, how many mailings are you going to have to do to collect from these 340 people? Is it going to be three at $225 each? How much time are principals going to have to take to meet with each one of these parents? How many of the parents are going to actually show up after you get a hold of them? And after you work out an agreement, how long is it going to take to write a letter? Who's going to follow up on each letter? I don't know. It's a bad policy. My suggestion is you put it back in committee and you rework it with more input. You have many people that want to donate. It's a horrible policy please redo it. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Crystal Ye, and I am the 8th grade president at Rosa International Middle School. My group and I are interested in having an assessment done to have solar panels implemented throughout the district. 
This would ex include examining space for the solar panels and cost of installation. There are environmental benefits, financial benefits, curriculum and career opportunities, and social advancements that come with using solar panels. Installing solar panels would be a major advancement for our district in becoming more socially conscious and sustainable. Solar power, power is a clean and renewable source and is readily available every day, meaning that it has very few pollutants and does not run out. Using solar power as the district's main source of energy would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, especially carbon dioxide. Greenhouse gas is caused by the burning of fossil fuels, which can lead to rising global temperatures and climate change. Currently, the district is using natural gas, electricity, and oil. These sources are neither green nor renewable. When burned for energy, oil gives off carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and volatile organic compounds. Sulfur dioxide causes acid rain, which is harmful to plants and animals that live in water. Although natural gas produces 50% less carbon dioxide compared to oil, it, is also, it also produces methane, which is another greenhouse gas. Climate change contributes to environmental and public health issues in the Northeast. An analysis by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, found that widespread solar adoption would significantly reduce nitric oxides, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter emissions, all of which can cause health problems. However, we can combat, combat these health problems by switching to solar power. NREL found that, among other health benefits, solar power results in fewer cases of chronic bronchitis, respiratory, and cardiovascular problems, and lost work days related to health issues. Unfortunately, Camden County received an F grade for air quality by the American Lungs Association in 2018, along with 11 other counties in New Jersey. The district is responsible for contributing to the high pollution levels in the area, and many students are exposed to these harmful and unhealthy pollutants. Continuing to use the energy sources we are currently using, such as oil, natural gas, and electricity, would be hurting the well-being of the people in Cherry Hill and also contribute to climate change. Climate change is a prevalent issue in today's world, and we must not continue to ignore it. It is important for both the health of the earth and the district students that we begin to look at the environmental benefits of implementing solar panels. Having an assessment done to see where the solar panels can be implemented would be a step in a more environmentally friendly future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, Crystal. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to make an exception because uh, this is typically the time where we're talking about agenda items, but I, I see there's a, you, some young, young kids, uh, young students, I should say. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and have you guys come on up. And if you want to speak, feel free. Um, and we'll be out of order right now. <laughs> Hello, my name is Daniel Lovadia. I am a seventh grader at Rosa International Middle School. Implementing solar panels would provide career opportunities and a chance to add to their curriculum. Solar panels are an amazing example of technological advancement. Therefore, it can make more students interested in pursuing STEM careers. In 2015, there were 8.6 million STEM jobs, and that number continues to grow. So the more the Cherry Hill School District could do to encourage STEM programs, the better. Solar panels would, need, uh, would also enhance the curriculum, particularly in the STEM class. Companies like Need and PG&E produce materials for solar education programs. In science and STEM, a solar-centered unit or unit just on renewable energy could be introduced, for example. Another possible unit would be added to the curriculum that would be a STEM program that would have students measure the output from the solar panels. That is what the Roxbury Latin School did when they got solar panels at their school. Another possible unit to, to add would be the, would be the study of how so solar energy transfers into electricity. Solar panels would be especially good because STEM has a lot to do with how things work. Solar panels are one of the best pieces of technology for this because they have so many pieces that you can study in them. With all these possible units, it is clear that there are many ways solar panels could improve the curriculum greatly. Another reason the Cherry Hill School District should install solar panels is they last a long time. The average life expectancy for a solar panel is 40 years. 40 years ago, the middle school I currently attend would not have been built for another 19 years. 40 years ago is a long time, especially for a piece of technology. To conclude my speech, the Cherry Hill School District 
should do an assessment of the schools to see if solar panels are right for us because solar panels could enhance the excitement about STEM careers and they could add to the curriculum and they last a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kyle Lerfeld and I'm an eighth grader at Rosa in addition and I'm the vice president of the Rosa Student Council. Having solar panels would be an investment, but in the long run would save the district money. The money that was saved could be utilized for more educational programs. Obviously, up front, there's going to be a large escalation in the amount of money being paid for energy. Installation, si shipping, assessing, etc., all tack onto the cost. However, according to our research, a along with the solar panel installation company's help, the school district could be making money off of them in approximately 4.5 years. Uh, I have a graph here, but uh, it's not really large enough and I'm having tef technical difficulties, but you'll see in four and a half years it'll um, bounce above and you'll come out from that zero. And in um, within 25 years you'll be paying $243,500 less than what you're paying now just for Rosa. Um, and every 40 years, like Danny said, it'll, you know, you'll start that process over again. In addition, the solar panels may not have to be paid fully by the school district. The township of Cherry Hill, along with several other nearby towns, have teamed up to offer financial help going solar. We're not entirely positive that our schools qualify, but it's still something worth looking into. Additionally, the district may not have to pay, you know, we'll have to pay some, but, I mean, it's better than, you know, full. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Ellie Nell, and I'm also a part of Rosa's Student Council as well. I will be talking about how implementing solar panels in our district will help keep up with the world around us, and how solar panels will help the district aim for a more positive future. In our state of New Jersey, there are growing numbers of schools implementing solar panels. The cost of solar panels have decreased, which makes solar panels more willing to take action and include solar panels in their district. As costs of solar panels are becoming more cost effective, many schools will catch on to what may make schools stand out and become well known to others. Um, like how many schools are taking action on pu putting solar panels, it is our district's commitment to do the same. Let's say most schools create an environment subject to renewable energy and our schools don't do the same. Many parents and guardians in the future may want the solar panels required in their schools. In the future, the majority of schools may have solar panels. However, our schools may be behind in the future if we do not act soon. We can also spread awareness of what our district has become a part of by implementing solar panels in schools. By implementing solar panels, we, be we become a part of something bigger than ourselves. We become a part of a movement to help save our planet. Also, when we put solar panels in our schools, it helps show others that Cherry Hill schools are moving forward in a br brighter future. This can cause more people to come to schools in Cherry Hill as renewable energy can be become what people are looking for. It is significant for Cherry Hill schools to have an assessment done to apply solar panels in their district because Cherry Hill is also the 11th largest school district in New Jersey. We can show that Cherry Hill School, the Ch Cherry Hill school District is making a difference to the future as well. We need to take action soon as the generation we are in is now soon going to be our future. Thank you. Uh, I have to say those are some great suggestions. Uh, I can't uh, speak for uh, the administration on th th those exactly, but uh, I'm sure th uh, that's something that we can definitely look into. But thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. Um, going back to our agenda, are there any other uh, um, comments on agenda items? If not, um, that's going to end our, our first uh, public comment section. And uh, we're going to uh, turn it over now to Dr. Malash uh, for uh, any comments that he may have for superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. So happy September. Uh, been very excited. It's been an exciting month as we opened up schools. Uh, we are just a few weeks in, and it feels uh, always when schools reopen, the incredible excitement those first couple of days. And honestly, by the second or third day of school, uh, as we went out and visited schools, everybody's into a routine. 
the kids know where they're going, the teachers are in their routine. It, it's fascinating. Even the summer break went by July and August, last couple weeks in, in, uh, in June. Um, after a couple of days, the kids are back and the staff is back. Um, everybody's back into a routine. Certainly one of the highlights of the opening in school has been um, the beginning of our full-day kindergarten program. I have an opportunity to visit the majority of the full-day full day classes throughout the district. Uh, the week before school opened over at Cooper, we did our ribbon cutting, uh, which is a, a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal morning. Children and families were there. In fact, uh, Mrs. Wilson, we had posted on the on the website. Uh, we had a couple of the new kindergartners actually wore a GoPro, so you would get a, an image from uh, from the kindergartners' perspective about what took place, both with ribbon cutting and visiting in the classroom. Uh, the classroom is an edited Mrs. Wilson, a minute and a half, two minutes or so. Um, with uh, the student that walked around in the classroom. We watched the unedited version, which was about nine minutes long, uh, and I needed to, to wear a little seatbelt because just how busy that five-year-old was walking around that classroom and looking, uh, it was incredible. Um, but it's been really exciting. Um, we have you know, new furniture in many of the rooms, uh, but just to see the difference in what's going on uh, in the implementation of the program you know, that Dr. Mahan and the team over the course of the last two years worked on uh, to be prepared for the implementation. An incredible amount of work um, from when the determination was made at the board meeting in October of 2017 you know, to those, uh, those children arriving in September of 2019. So it has been very, very exciting for all of us. Um, we're starting to see what the impact is on the school because there is an impact uh, on the school overall. First, there's a social impact with the kindergartners there all day. What does lunch look like? What does recess look like? Uh, and truly, you know, the, one of the great things about this time of year is the recess that goes on during the lunch that's outside. And there's joy, you know, being outside on the, on the, on the playground for the kindergartners all the way up until, uh, you know, the fifth graders as well in terms of, of what that looks like. So it has been very, very exciting. Um, Jake and Jacob and Jack talked about some of the things that are going on over at High School East and High School West. Uh, fall sports are in full swing at all of our secondary schools. Encourage everyone to go on the, on the school websites, um, try and get out to the games. Um, great community opportunity to get out and to see people and to watch the children compete. Uh, this Saturday evening, as the guys talked about, over at the Deku Complex at the corner of Marlcrest and Cropwell, um, High School East and West. Um, there's going to be a girls varsity soccer game going on and a boys varsity soccer game going on at the same time at neighboring fields. Um, you know, promises to be a, a wonderful community event. So that's 6.30 p.m. this Saturday. Uh, it's the second, you know, kind of large scale east versus west uh, community event that they've done back in the spring. We did softball and baseball and uh, those activities going on during the course of the day. So if you can make it out this Saturday evening, 6.30 p.m. at Deku to see the kids uh, compete out there. Uh, we're also in the midst of celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month uh, throughout the district. The Hispanic population in Cherry Hill is the fastest growing population in Cherry Hill and has been over the course of the last four or five years. Um, on Saturday, October the 26th, which is actually a little bit after the, the regular celebration of the month, which goes mid-September to mid-October, uh, we will be hosting a Hispanic um, Heritage Month celebration at Carusi Middle School. More details to come. Um, so our student organizations, Latinos at West and the Latinos and, and Amigos at East, are co-sponsoring the event with the Cherry Hill Hispanic Civic Association. So it promises to be a wonderful uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, so again, mark your calendars to block out that time on Saturday, October the 26th. Um, we'll see the annual tours will take place. I did a quick minute last week with Latinos at West um, to talk about their annual tour where they go out and they bring music and dancing and culture to the elementary schools and to the middle schools um, throughout the district. So uh, very exciting as well. Um, keep in touch with what's going on uh, in the district. Follow along on the website. Um, there are a number of social media platforms through which we push information, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, if you have questions about the school district, the best place to ask those is to the school district. Um, you can get the most accurate information and, and the most straightforward answers uh, about what's going on. There is a quick question feature that's on the website, so you can send that in. That's moderated. Uh, Mrs. Wilson goes through that. We post the questions and the responses on the website. There's a tremendous amount of information on the district website and on the individual school websites as well. Um, so I encourage people to follow along. If you have not downloaded the app, there's a Cherry Hill School District app, both in um, Google Play Store um, and in the iTunes Store that you can download for free. You can customize that so you can get information about individual schools uh, or about all the schools that are in the district as well. So happy September. Um, October is coming very quickly. Um, to those who are celebrating, we are uh, schools are closed this coming Monday and Tuesday for Rosh Hashanah, and then we'll be closed, God bless you, we'll be closed the following Wednesday. Wednesday, right, uh, for Yom Kippur. Um, so to those who are observant and celebrating, um, you'll be in our thoughts as well. All right.
Thank you. So uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and move into our action agenda. And first up, we're, I'm going to ask um, Mrs. Matlack to move the curriculum and instruction items. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following. Number one, approval of attendance at conferences and workshops for the 2019-2020 school year. Number two, approval of out-of-district student placements for 2019-2020 school year. Number three, approval of services contract with the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired for the 2019-2020 school year. Number four, approval of special education settlement agreement. And on your yellow sheet, we have an addition to number one, approval of attendances at conferences and workshops for the 2019-2020 school year. Do I have a second? Mrs. Seidel, are there any questions or comments on that? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars? Mrs. Matlack? Yes. Mrs. Neary? Yes. Mr. Avadia? Yes. Mrs. Seidel? Yes. Mrs. Schultz? Yes. Mrs. Stratton? Yes. Mrs. Tong? Yes. Mr. Goodwin? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Matlack. Uh, next, uh, we're going to have our BNF uh, agenda items, and I'm going to ask Mrs. Schultz to move those, please. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. Number one, financial reports. Number two, resolution for the award of bids. Number three, resolution for the award of transportation. Number four, donations. And we have a blue sheet and it is item two, resolution approving transferring of funds for proper funding of construction project stage accessibility at various locations. And item three, resolution for the award of bids. Do I have a second? Mrs. Neary, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Sugars. Mrs. Schultz? Yes to all. Mrs. Matlack? Yes to all. Mrs. Neary? Yes. Mr. Avadia? Yes. Mrs. Seidel? Yes. Mrs. Stratton? Yes. Mrs. Tong? Yes. Mr. Goodwin? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Schultz. And next up, we have our uh, human resources agenda items. And I'm going to ask Mrs. Tong to move those items, please. The superintendent recommend that I move the following. One, termination of employment certificated. Two, termination of employment non-certificated. Three, appointment certificated. Four, appointment non-certificated. Five, leave of absence certificated. Six, leave of absence non-certificated. Seven, assignment salary change non-certificated, eight, other compensations certificated, nine, other compensation, compensation non-certificated, 10, approval of new job descriptions, and on the uh, pink sheet, um, um, two, termination of, two, termination of employment non-certificated, and up to number 11, other motions add on to it. Any other questions? Oh, do I have a second? Sorry. Okay, Mrs. Seidel. Are there any questions? Okay, see none. Mrs. Schiff. Mrs. Tong? Yes. Mrs. Matlack? Yes. Mrs. Neary? Yes. Mr. Avadia? Yes. Mrs. Seidel? Yes. Mrs. Schultz? Yes to all. Mrs. Stratton? Yes. Mr. Goodwin? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. And next, um, you know, I believe Mrs. Uh, we have p &L and I'm going to ask um, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Neary to move those items, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, the superintendent, re the superintendent recommends, and I move the following: number one, first reading of policy and regulations; number two, second reading of policy and regulations; number three, resolution for recognition of Week of Respect; number four, resolution for recognition of School Violence Awareness Week; and number five, approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying hearing decisions. Do I have a second, Mrs. Matlack? Are there any questions? I think um, this 
just one thing for clarification on unpaid meals. So I think one issue to, to resolve. So there's an idea out there that at some point with the meals, when we link the, the sticks of it to, um, to, to school property, that were sort of uh, that that the kids end up paying for the parents' mistake. My question is, in Mount Laurel, we know that collections is something that's at least in the policy. I don't know if that's effective, but do we have a general sense that that is not effective to do collections with uh, the adults themselves, in terms of a small claims court? Or th this is one thing that I think, just for clarification, that that we're pretty sure that that's not a viable means. I don't know if I'm asking, I guess, Laurie, if you know, or... <laughs> we, we've we talked about a collection agency. It's not something that we have perf pursued formally to do that. Um, again, you know, our desire uh, in addressing the needs in the policy is we know that there are <coughs> children and families um, who are in need of support. Right? It's, it's about us being able to connect with those families, meet with those families, get the families that need the support, the support that they will benefit from, right, so that the, the children uh, are getting what they need, and to identify families who certainly have the means and the opportunity to make good on the bills that are owed and, and have them do that. Um, but we have not invested the time, you know, or the energy into doing anything more formal uh, about hiring a collection agency to do it. Um, you know, for us, it comes back about trying to build relationships with the families individually from the school, the principal, the school counselor. You know, one of the great things about Cherry Hill that, that we talk about ourselves and folks in our community talk about is the support of the community that's here. Folks out look out for one another, you know, and, and that's what it is. You know, the, the impersonal piece of a collection agency making a call, sending a letter, you know, is, is just not someplace that we believe that we should be involved in as a school district. So, Mr. Avadia, on a professional level, the company that I work for, one arm of the company, does collections for Fortune 100 companies, and a wildly successful collection campaign collects 1% of the total debt, and that's wildly successful. Our clients are happy with that. So if that gives you some perspective as to what would be a successful collection campaign, and, and um, out of that has to come the percentage of commission you're giving back to the collection company that's doing the collecting for you so um, so I also just had a couple comments on um, the policy 8550 um, I guess just to be blunt I'm a bit frustrated um, by this ongoing discussion um, as I mentioned at last meeting, I think that the policy that we have in front of us now is a great balance and a great compromise. Um, it is a mandatory policy, so first there's that. Um, but there continues to be, in my opinion, misinformation, miscommunication that we are not feeding children. That has never been the case, and it won't be the case. And I'm incredibly frustrated that there are those that want to continue that narrative, even though it is blatantly untrue. Um, and so let's move over to the topic of using the same policy that we have for library books to handle this debt now. Um, that library book policy, or the, the protocol for handling an overdue library book, has been in place for many, many years. And there's not a whole lot of parents or students jumping up and down saying, my kid's not going to the prom because we didn't return a library book. The whole purpose of this conversation, the whole reason it was brought up in the first place, and I, just a reminder, it was the this table that brought it up um, on purpose so that we could have a conversation about this policy. But the whole point of this discussion is to get the communication flowing between these families and the district. Whether they can afford to pay or not, if they can't, then we want to help them figure out a way around this. So, you know, if somebody just calls, 
sends an email, says, hey, I can't do this now, or I can't pay this, end of story. I'm never going to be able to pay it. The conversation then doesn't go, okay, great, your kid's not going to prom. Your kid's not going to the zoo. The conversation is then, you know, what can we do to help you? That's the goal of this policy and this conversation. We want we want the families that are not paying to communicate with us so we can help the ones who can't pay. And quite frankly, the ones who can pay should pay. I mean, I don't think we should be in the business of just allowing people to not pay their bills if they can. Um, we have to be fiscally responsible. That is one of the roles, one of the key roles of a board member. So I'm really frustrated that we're still having this discussion um, on on social media, quite frankly, by what I think is um, a relatively small group of people. I, I know as a board member, I'm not getting emails of outrage from community members on a daily basis. I've received one. So I, I feel like, um, I, you know, I use this term in, in conversation with somebody, I feel like there's a bit of faux outrage about this going on. And I'm personally excited about this policy because I think it gives us everything we want. Um, it addresses getting the families to contact us. So um, it, it's not about not letting the kids go to the zoo or prom. It's about let's help the people who need the help and let's hold the people accountable who don't. And that's just my two cents. So just a couple things that I thought you know, may be worth mentioning is we're down in terms of registrations for free and reduced lunch this year in the community. Um, I don't know if this belongs in correspondence, but I went to the Carusi, you know, barbecue to kind of popularize it. It was extremely well attended. Um, I thought a lot of people came out for that, uh, and perhaps in part because we're, you know, we've spent time discussing this. But the other piece of information is that we're, we're very low in terms of redemption on our, uh, I'm going to say, free and reduced breakfast, hoping that's correct. Um, given that people will, it seems like, be talking about this still for a long time, I mean, there are, there are aspects of advocacy that could hopefully lead some families. So what would be just like the right suggestion for people to take advantage of what we have to offer, I guess, as a follow-up? Okay. So I think your question, Mr. Avadia, is how can families help that want to help? Right? Was that kind of what you were asking? Yeah, 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 sort of both directing others, I mean, as well as, I suppose, donating. But yes, absolutely. Right. So um, as a former zone PTA chair and a former PTA president, um, I, I would contend that starting with your PTA, that's a great place to start. Um, there's no reason why Zone PTA can't organize all of the PTAs and organize our communities to collect, um, to accept donations and direct them possibly to the Cherry Hill Food Pantry or to our backpack program. There's, there's no reason that can't happen. Um, and that would be a great community effort. And that's where I think that belongs. I don't necessarily believe that administration should be responsible for accepting and divvying out donations. Um, so for me, I think that would be a great place to start is, you know, have zone PTA or PTA presidents sort of band together, which is what zone PTA is, and kick something off, get something started. Can I just add, though, I just as a point of clarification, if somebody is willing or wants to donate money, they certainly can contact the administration. We are happy to take that money and put it back into the backpack program. So I just, I want to also, I also echo Lisa's entire statement and sentiments, but I also want to just, there's been a lot of um, 
the district isn't looking for donations or money. I just would like to kind of maybe redirect that to say we are looking for money, we are looking for donations, but it just we would like to have it be filtered through the district to the backpack program. Um, so can we just maybe, uh, Dr. Malash, can you just maybe speak to that? So for folks that are looking to make donations, um, if the zone PTA, if, if that takes a little bit longer to organize for folks that are willing to write checks today, they know how to do that. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Um, so last year we started through a grant uh, through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, you know, Friday back food backpacks um, that were sent home. The grant has expired, right? It extinguished. We spent the money uh, on the program last year. Um, those families that, that benefited from the food are still here, right? And, and there's more. We could have expanded if we had more money to be able to do that. Uh, if folks, and, and I've said this through the month of August and into September, if folks are looking to donate money or want to do that, we would absolutely accept that money. They can make a donation. They can send a letter into the district. They can send it to me. They can send it to Mr. Sugars. They certainly can go through, you know, through the PTA if they would like to do it that way um, as well. You know, what, what I've said all along, and, and my message has not changed with the perspective that we have as, you know, the administrative side or the district is we're not looking for folks to make donations to cover what the lunch debt is, right? That, that does not solve the problem. Um, you know, we wiped away $25,000 in debt two years ago. Um, since that time, we've wiped away more than $10,000 in debt in the last two years working with families who have had the issues, um, you know, that, that have developed. Um, if folks want to do something, money certainly is always one way to do it. Um, you know, I, I've had one parent contact me about the backpack program, um, you know, that she and her, and her child were interested. Honestly, that's it from our community. That is it from our community of people saying, um, you know, that they want to organize something to be able to do that. A lot of people have talked about it, um, but I, I've had one person that has contacted me at this point um, to, to actually go through. But again, wiping away the, the debt that exists, I'd much rather that we were working with the families because there are children that would benefit not just from free and reduced lunch and not just from the free and reduced breakfast, but from the additional programs that are available, you know, and, and at different levels that, you know, whether it's middle school and high school, the student activity fee piece that goes through, SAT and ACT and the fees, AP, the fees that are associated with that, applications to college, additional social services that exist throughout Camden County. Camden County has some wonderful services that would benefit families. Right? Tough times affect everybody to go through. You know, and, as, and if we can work with them and support them, that's what we're here to do. Right? It's about making a difference for the individual child. You know, and as Mrs. Seidel said, no child is, is being not given lunch. Kids are given lunch. Right? They've, they've gone through. Was the discussion that we went through in the past year, were they given tuna fish? Yes. You know, we put out to, to, the, to the schools before school started. Whatever meal, right? The child's got to come up through with a meal. Whatever meal that child presents at the cash register, whether they're charging it or not, that's the meal the child gets, right? There, there's no difference in terms of whatever the child chooses the meal is the meal they go through. Um, that's continued. It's a, it, you know, it's about supporting children. Um, that's where we are. You know, if, if people have questions, we try not to. We try to be relatively easy to find. Again, whether it's through public information, a quick question, regular email, um, coming up to meetings, you know that kind of stuff. Uh, we are here, willing and, and able to do it. I, I did just want to also make a comment. Uh, uh, number one, I do want to wholeheartedly uh, um, support what Mrs. Seidel uh, said in her statement. And also, I just really believe that where we're at right now, uh, we were able to have the hard conversation. I know the, that Mrs. Seidel was here leading one of those hard conversations when there's a lot of, well, actually at Carusi, I, I believe, uh, leading one of those hard conversations. And, and we've had those hard conversations. We had to go through this. And we didn't, it, you know, people could say it was a self-inflicted wound. But basically, we, we decided we wanted to have that discussion so that we can make the policy better. And, and we had that discussion. We had a lot of uh, input from the community, uh, a lot of suggestions, a lot of things that went through. And where we're at right now, I believe, is at a good spot. Um, we're at a spot where we can uh, clearly make sure that there's no, um, it, though it's ha not happened in the past, there's n it won't happen in the future, that no child will be turned away in terms of having lunch. Uh, but at the same time, we can be uh, fiscally responsible as a district and also be able to be compassionate and work with parents and work with the community as, as needed. And so I just really want to uh, thank once again the board and, and the community and all the input and feedback that was uh, uh, put into this conversation. I really feel like we have a win here. I really believe that we have a good policy that's going to meet the needs of the people and that the community should really be proud of. I, I believe 
I, don't, I haven't looked at it, but I would say Cherry Hill is probably leading the pack. And, and we've had a, a large community voice uh, speaking, and we've listened to that community voice. We've had the board members and other input, and we've been able to listen and synthesize all, all that, that to come down with policy, I believe, that's really going to truly meet the needs of the students. And so I just really want to once again thank the board, I thank the community, all the feedback and input, and I really hope that we can pull together as a community and really support each other and lift each other up and, and uh, not throw arrows. <laughs> but um, I, I just really feel like this is a, just a good win overall. I, just, uh, the, I think the, I, I, I like the policy and, uh, and I think it is a good compromise between where we were and where we, we need to move forward. I just, like Ms. Seidel said, it's a little bit frustrating, um, but I would like to see us from here just continue to do the data behind what has gone into the, the problem of the debt and, and not so much everyone assume what uh, the data is. It is more divisive to our community to continue um, this narrative of that we know who's on the list. And as a, I, I can only speak as a woman of color and as a woman of color that lives in Cherry Hill and has been a single mom and has now become a married woman, I've been on that list, was on it up till two days ago. So, but what I don't like is that we created these groups and we've decided who's on it, and we've decided that it's people that can't afford it. We've decided that it's people that don't speak English, and we decided that there were immigrants on the list. And we made all these assumptions with no data to back it. So that, I think, has led into some of the divisiveness on social media and, and, and some of the outrage, quote, unquote. Um, but as someone that is part of some of those special groups and categories, I don't, I don't think it's very fair for us to assume that those are the people that are of those 300. Um, I think that I applaud the district for not actually sitting and saying who is on there because that can also be divisive. But I will hope that internally the district continues some data, continues to see what we can do uh, in terms of who's been on free and reduced and who has not, and if situations have changed and economic statuses have changed. But I would urge us as a community to not continue uh, this narrative of who we know and, and what we think until we actually have data to back it. So. Here, here. Anyone else? Okay, Ms. Sugars. Mrs. Neary. Yes. Mrs. Matlack. Yes to all. Mr. Avadia. Yes. Mrs. Seidel. Yes to all. Mrs. Schultz. Yes to all. Mrs. Stratton. Yes. Mrs. Tong. Yes. Mr. Goodwin. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Neary. And uh, next on the list, uh, we have strategic planning, and I'm going to ask Mrs. Seidel to move those items, please. There are no items. <laughs> I missed that one. So <laughs> thank you for uh, quickly taking care of that. <laughs> um, so so um, next we have our second public comment. And at this point in time, you can comment on any item you'd like to, you would like to. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I asked you to just give us your name, address, and um, you'll have three minutes to comment on whatever item you'd like to. Good evening. That's a bit. That's wrong. Pat McCargo, 991 Kingston Drive. And it's really not something that's on the agenda, but it's something that's on my mind. And I'm sure you've seen it on social media about the young lady who was walking to West and was, um, you know, somebody followed her all the way to school and tried to bring her into their car. And I note this because the person and her daughter are family, not by blood, but they're family. And when she called me to tell me the story, I started doing a little search, and I know 
that the police department is involved. My question to you as the board is, is there a policy to disseminate that information to parents? Do you have a responsibility to notify parents that that's going on? And I say that because it would make parents more alert to the potential problems, not to scare them, but just to maybe step up their game. We know what happened in Blackwood. We don't want it to happen here. So if there's a policy, um, I'd like to know what it is. If there's not a policy, my question is why not? And should not this be posted somewhere on the media, your media outlets, you know, like your Facebook or whatever the page is? And I, and I know that the police department is working with it. Maybe you uh, wait for the police department to do it. But I think that needs to be put up somewhere that, so that parents are aware to watch their children. We live in a different world today. And I worry about all our kids, especially when the weather starts getting darker earlier and these kids are going out at dark. And although this is a high school young lady and she had the foresight to kind of like pay attention and knew what to do, but what if it was a young kid and they didn't know what to do? So, you know, are we going to send pa notes home to parents in backpacks or are you going to let each school disseminate the information? But to do nothing, I think, is, is a bad precedent. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Matthew Brin, 1924, Pippin Circle. Um, I just wanted to allude to something that Mr. Avadia said earlier about the barbecue at Carusi, which I also attended, was very well attended, and I really appreciate that the school district is doing outreach for the free and reduced lunch program. This program is very important for making sure, um, like this conversation that has been happening over the last couple months, that the kids in our schools are eating every single day and getting uh, nutritious meals. I think uh, the superintendent said a couple of sessions ago that 20% of Cherry Hill students uh, are living in or near the poverty line and would uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. I think that we need to allocate our outreach resources towards making sure that um, all of those kids who need meals or need to be on the free and reduced lunch program are and that they are getting the food and nutrition that they need. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not from Cherry Hill, actually. I'm from Princeton. Uh, my name is Dinesh Sharma. I represent Steamwork Studios. I have a folder here uh, of our materials. Um, not to do an infomercial, but we're a STEM company, so I am wholeheartedly with the Rosa uh, Middle Schoolers who presented about solar panels earlier and the advantage of STEM. So we're a STEM company, and we've been actually offering um, uh, modules, courses here at the Rec Center in Cherry Hill through the summer and will be in uh, fall and spring as well. So I just wanted to introduce our, our, our company, myself here, and maybe share some information with you about uh, some of the courses we're offering from coding, building, robotics, um, uh, sustainability, and the like. Thank you. Mr. Charmer, if you'll give the information to Mrs. Wilson. Sure. Over on the side. I will. Thank you. Good evening, Kim Prydell, Nine Gately Court. Uh, just a couple of comments and questions. And first, um, Ms. Stratton, I completely agree with you 100%. We need data so that we're not making decisions without backup. Um, Ms. McCargo, exactly. Communication is an ongoing issue in Cherry Hill Public Schools. A letter could have been sent out, not to alarm, but be aware. We, we know it's not substantiated, but be aware that this may have occurred. You know, talk to your children, go over safety pro protocols. Um, the food account. This is a hard policy. Um, I think everybody is working really hard to make something work. I love that there is that meeting, that communication, that outreach, and that help. I'm going to say, I'm a little late to the game, but today I went on Pay School Central because my kids don't really buy lunches. We, we send lunch. Um, so I went on to register them, and I was looking for the spot where I could say no snacks, and I could not find it anywhere. So my question is, if we get the data, and we're finding that a lot of these are snack-related, why don't we have an ability to online, since we can pay online and we can do all of these other things online, hit that button? 
because I'm going to tell you that if I sent a letter with my sixth grader, I don't know that it would get to the cafeteria saying that she couldn't buy snacks, right? Um, I went to the Carusi barbecue as well. It was wonderful. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who coordinated it on the administrative end, but it was well attended and a lot of families, and it was a nice time. So great, great opportunity for people to get to know each other. Um, one other question: back in late August, there was a position posted with the title of coordinator of student accounts. And I'm just curious what that position is, and I'm just wanting to make sure that we're not going to be paying somebody a salary of forty or fifty thousand dollars to collect lunch debt. And that may not be what it is, but I did not see the job description, only the title. So if we could have um, clarification, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Yoni Yar, 329 Cherry Hill Boulevard. Ah. Um, as a first alum of Ro Rose, it was really nice to see Ms. Merlot and the students that uh, Rose has an amazing tradition of student empowerment. I think it's one of the leading schools in the district for the last 20 years, and that culture has only continued and gotten stronger. So really excited for me as someone who really cares deeply about that school in particular to see that tonight. Um, if it's possible, when Ms. Wilson posts this meeting on social media, if we could link out to the YouTube visit video. Uh, one of the challenges of a stationary a uh, camera that's set up to view all of you and not necessarily anything on the screen behind you is that you can't see it if you're watching from home. So if we can just share out that link so people can get a chance to view that, it was incredible and just more people should see it, especially this work of students being done. Just in terms of the consequences, I think they have been around since I was a student in the district. I vaguely recall almost getting some of those consequences, but not returning a textbook and not returning a library book. So I'm glad those are now being intertwined to each other. I mean, I graduated 15 years ago, so it's at least longer than that. So. Um, nice to see that. Uh, my parents wanted me to mention that Dr. Smith and Dr. Malash's Twitter feed is one of the best things in this district ever. They have enjoyed it thoroughly following your jaunts across all the schools this last month and they've really gotten to enjoy seeing that and re-engage them in the process having been out of the district since I graduated. Um, so they really appreciate that. Um, also think the district has done a great job this year catching some students. My family was on the outside of a student that got caught in the kindergarten and had to be switched around and my daughter was part of that and just really glad that we've got classroom teachers who are out in this district catching the students early and that we've really empowered our classroom teachers and our administrators to catch students when they can so it doesn't become a problem and because of full day kindergarten I think we're catching more because of teachers are more aware of the students. They're there for all the school day and just really thank you for that. Also congratulations on that district hiring. I know it was a big part of the commitment of the cultural proficiency in the five-year plan and goal two. Um, it takes a lot of effort. We're not the only district competing for more diversity amongst the staff. It is a, everyone wants them. Um, and to really be able to grow that number and see it exponentially grow in the last couple of years is kudos to that team and uh, you guys committing to doing that because it doesn't happen without the people around this table saying, you have to do it and make it happen. Um, I also wanted to know, when we do the numbers for the student, for free and reduced lunch, does that take into account those students who are auto-enrolled via SNAP, TANF, and those other programs? Or is that only those people who are applying separate from that? So just don't know that, something new to me. I didn't even know about auto-enrollment until about two months ago. Um, so I was just curious how that number is playing to that. And I think that covers it. Thank you. I'm not giving a sermon. <laughs> Anne Einhorn, 1017 Edgemore Road. So thank you, Mrs. Seidel, and thank you, Mrs. Stratton, for the comments that you made this evening. This labeling and grouping any kind of kid, regardless of what group, it, it, uh, absolutely appalls me, particularly on social media. And how dare we ask who these 354 families are and who they are and what they represent. You know, that's a, that's a private, personal matter. And it really offended me as well, but Facebook took it to a whole new level. H how dare we ask for such personal information? I am comfortable with your new revised policy. Um, what I'm really comfortable about is that in 5513, that the word may is used, not can and will be. 
That's a very important word to have in that policy since people assume that you're going to, but you are not with the word it's in that policy. I do have a question, though, in regards to 8550 and 8508, the lunch offer versus serve program. Does this play into this policy in a way, shape, or form, whereas there are certain items that the child is supposed to be fed and then they have the right of refusal and then there is an option of three other items. Is there any crossover with those two that could cause a problem in getting 8550 moving ahead? That's my number one question. As always, I thank all of you for what you do, but on the other hand, I am really disappointed in my community because we are supposed to be in this together. I spoke of this before, I sound like a broken record, I sound like I'm on a soapbox, but I don't care if you're running for office, I don't care if you're, you're a stay-at-home mom, I don't care who you are, but we are supposed to be in this together and work, and work together. Um, Facebook, social media does not allow us to do that. I would also beg the people in the community that have these questions they keep posting, please go to your school administrator. Please start at the building level. Get the accurate information. It does none of us any good as a community with these statements of what one knows and what one's been through. I went through this 100 years ago. Well, I am 100 years old myself. I went through building protocol 100 years ago. Um, which brings me to the fact that you're right about the donations for the moment. Uh, and I have been told that certain prominent community members have approached the school district and wanting to pay off the debt. And if tonight's words uh, that were said, apparently that has not happened, which I'm very disappointed because I sent personally sent personal emails and messaging when it appeared on Facebook. So I'm disappointed in that. But you know what? We'll get through this together. Thank you. Thank you. Karthik Pejavera, Nine Artisan Way. <coughs> so I was sitting in the audience and I heard the Rosa kids uh, speak about the solar panels. And I just want to say that I think the East community also as well, um, and me and myself, uh, I uh, wholeheartedly support, support their, um, their uh, request for looking into technology, like solar technology. Um, I feel that uh, doing so would show the Cherry Hill District's um, innovative uh, ideas and it's recently these days um, environmental uh, and climate change uh, is such a hot topic. Um, research, sh research shows that if we don't do something about this right now, um, it'll really affect us in t uh, a period of time that's not so far away. Um, so if, Cherry, if the Cherry Hill District looks into something like that, um, we'd be showing how much we care about the environment, how, how innovative of a district that we are. Um, also, recently there was a nationwide um, day where students went and protested for climate, uh, against climate change and uh, told or spoke out, spoke their mind um, against the government uh, and called for um, more regulation. Um, there's also been a an conservation club at East that recently got started up. Um, this just shows how how concerned East students are about the environment, and I wholeheartedly support um, what those uh, students asked for. And I think that it's a great idea for the district to look into solar energy as well as other ways to, um, as well as other forms of renewable energy for the district. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Short, 1002 Chelton Parkway. <coughs> so I missed, uh, basically missed the whole meeting. I just caught the last 10 seconds. Again, I will reiterate, this policy is idiotic. Completely idiotic. Why? Because you're spending hours and hours and hours acting as collection agencies. This is not the job of a counselor this is not the job of a principal. 
five hours and 40 minutes trying to track down each kid and collect every cent when you have multiple people trying to help you with the community to accept donations um, is just idiotic. But, and let me reiterate this because I don't control NewJersey.com and I know it's non-scientific, but when you're seeing so many angry people about this new prom policy, I'm warning you, it's going to be a wave after you make the decision and after you vote for it. People are going to be angry, and they don't follow it as close as some of us in this room. And I don't control anything on NewJersey.com. And again, it's just, it's just a, a gut feeling. It's not going to be good when you vote on it. That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, there was an incident that occurred at Cherry Hill West on Friday the 13th. I have no idea to the validity of it, um, but it's not good that there was no statement whether it occurred or not because it spread all over social media. Um, I'll end with some uh, good news. I went to the back to school night. Uh, it was very good. Teachers were great at Cherry Hill West. Teachers were all good at uh, Carusi and uh, Kingston. Uh, the only weird thing was is that at, uh, at West, I remember the first one where I was very, very impressed. They had all these clubs, uh, all the different photography clubs and uh, um, all these different clubs at the, the big high school one. I was pretty impressed, but they didn't seem to have that this year. So it's just a, it's just a suggestion if you want to get more children involved that maybe next year we promote it at back to school night. Um, I went to the cafeteria and there weren't any, unless I miss a whole area, but there was just people selling, telling, selling t-shirts and stuff like that. But you're going to vote on it. Micromanaging to every cent to collect for $11,000 makes logically no sense. And it's going to happen. Hope you make the right decision. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, then uh, I'm going to turn it to Mrs. Schultz and then I'm going to uh, have uh, Dr. Marsh speak to some of the questions. Uh, Mr. Sugars, uh, do we have the date of the security uh, community forum in October? I just, if we couldn't, we remind of that date. Yes, it's Just October 29th. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, and Ms. Schultz, just as, as you asked about that, so there's, we have stuff ready to go out. Uh, we'll start to advertise and push out to go through. So a couple of things. So, so first, um, let me talk about the relationship that the school district has with Cherry Hill Police Department um, and what happens when something happens. Right? So I can't speak about any specific events that have recently occurred. Um, I talk to the police chief on a pretty regular basis, um, but even more important than that, we have uh, Tony Saparito, who's our district director of security, who's the direct liaison between the Cherry Hill Police Department and the Cherry Hill School District. Um, under Mr. Saparito are the nine campus police officers that work for us. Um, when something happens, something that is concerning, um, thankfully children and adults um, go to our campus police, go to an administrator who then turns it over to campus police. Um, if something happens, campus police can take the report. They then enter that report um, in the same police system the Cherry Hill Police Department uses. The information gets in there and then Cherry Hill Police Department has to follow up when something takes place. Uh, depending upon what the nature of what happens, uh, it could be a police officer, it could be a detective. Um, by the memorandum of understanding that we have with the police department, when there's an active police investigation, we can't do anything until the police says, until the police department says, go ahead and do something. Um, and they have to make a determination and, and a level of what took place, right? So um, there's lots of things that get discussed. What the reality is that the police department and the police find, depending upon situations, uh, is not always something that we can share. Um, what I can tell you uh, is that this week, you know, we will have in our weekly newsletter that we'll put reminders out there. 
right? We always want that if there is a concern, if a child has a concern on their way to school, if they have a concern at school, if something is going on at home, they have a concern, to tell an adult, right? Tell an adult in the school, tell a secretary, tell a teacher, tell the nurse, tell a counselor, tell the campus police officers, let somebody know, right? We would always rather err on the side of caution that the appropriate people are following things up both within the school and within the community, right? But we have to do that with the police department. We can't go rogue and do it on our own. Um, because again, we also don't know the additional investigation uh, or investiga investigative um, things that are going on within the police department, right? So we can't just randomly send information out. The other thing about sharing information is there's also, you know, we get notified about stuff all the time. You know, one of the biggest things we get notified is about Megan's Law violators. So we get that information. That's not information that we can share, right? But we have to present it to, it has to be presented to us by the police department. We share Megan's Law notifications with staff, the staff that needs to know. There are real penalties that are associated with that if we share the information beyond there or with somebody that doesn't, that can't have that information. So we have to work with the police department. We have an incredible relationship that exists between the school district and the police department with where we are. I'm grateful to Chief Monahan and to the men and women of the police department for the work that they do uh, and for the role that they allow us to continue to play in keeping all of our children safe. We all have the same, the same desire. So that's that piece. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, the position, the coordinator of student accounts is a SAC position, school-age child care, uh, is what that came through. Um, if there are questions about Pace School Central, um, contact the school directly. There's somebody at one of the schools, or if not, we can put you in touch with somebody uh, about where to go in um, and to take care of that. Free and reduced lunch. So our overall numbers of free and reduced lunch um, do include the, the children who come through automatic enrollment, uh, but that's when we get the final account that comes through, not necessarily when uh, Ms. Sugars, um, we were talking earlier, where, where the, the number of applications that have come through so far are down. That does not include the direct enrollment. Um, our overall numbers do include direct enrollment at the end of the year. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Kirtuk and to the Rosa kids for you guys getting up and speaking. Uh, always grateful for the perspective on what you share. I think that's all of the pieces from tonight. Thank you, Dr. Milosh. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And at this point in time, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. Mrs. Seidel and Mrs. Uh, Schultz. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight.